The new year is often a time of reflection, a chance to look back on the past 365 days and remember. Sometimes the memories bring a smile, and other times they break our hearts. Chances are you've experienced a bit of both this past year. The new year is also a time to look ahead, to imagine what could be, to scan the horizon with expectation and seek God's guiding hand. It's a time to strive for better, to live louder, love stronger, and be more of who God has created us to be. It's an opportunity for new beginnings, a chance to start fresh, to pursue God with a renewed passion, and to press on with all our hearts. The truth is, God has been faithful this past year, and that faithfulness promises to carry us through the next. As the new year begins, may we remember this one simple truth. In Christ, we are a new creation. The old is gone, and the new has come. Sometimes we just need reminding of that, don't we? That the old has gone and the new has come. And that's what uh, Paul is reminding us in that verse to the Corinthian church. The old has gone and the new has come. Or the new is here and it's for us to do what we are going to do with it in this year. So here we are, 2nd of January 22. And I wonder what your hopes and dreams are for this year. I wonder how many times you've said Happy New Year trying to count them. Probably, I don't know, after being here this morning, uh, probably quite a lot of you was uh, Facebooking or sending messages. I know quite a few of you sent messages at 1 o'clock, 12 o'clock, maybe it's with a new phone, um, sending on uh, WhatsApp and all that stuff. Uh, but people do it, don't they? Uh, and uh, it time flags it as well. So you was up late, maybe, on uh, New Year's Day, or should I say early, on the New Year's morning you was up. But yeah, how many times have we said Happy New Year? And what are we actually saying when we say Happy New Year to someone? It sounds to me like a blessing, you know, that we're, we're giving a blessing to somebody by saying to them Happy New Year. So that's my blessing to you as we start 22. Um, it's a blessing. Happy New Year. I hope you do have a happy New Year, and I hope your hopes and dreams are going to be fulfilled this year. I think a lot of people stay up. I went to bed early on New Year's Eve, but uh, I think a lot of people stay up. What do they stay up for? What do you stay up for? Do you stay up to see the New Year in? I think a lot of people stay up to see the old year out. And it's probably more about seeing the old year out, especially now, 22, thinking about 21, thinking about 20, of all the things that's happened over the last couple of years. Are people really wanting to say goodbye to last year before they say hello to 22? Just to make sure, and this is what I think, a lot of people are saying, uh, let's make sure it's gone, um, so let's stay up and do that. Let's make sure it's definitely gone. Um, it's interesting, as I was looking around the world um, on Google, I found quite a number of different places that celebrate the New Year in different ways. In Ecuador, suppose you don't know about this, um, citizens set fire to scarecrows on New Year's Eve, and the scarecrows are filled with, uh, with paper. Um, and photographs that represent things that have gone on in the previous year, and they want to get rid of them, so they set fire to them. So as you can see in this picture in Ecuador, all around that area, people, isn't it great, Brian, that, you're, uh, that the sun is shining on you so, so much on 2nd of January that you can't see the screen? Absolutely wonderful. But there you go, burning paper, burning photographs of what's gone on in the previous year just to get rid of it and to say, welcome to the new year. What about Denmark? We know that the, the, the Danes, we don't know much about them, but we know that the Greeks love to smash plates, don't they? 
There's all that old saber dance and all that sort of stuff, people smashing plates. But in Denmark, apparently, they save up all plates during the year, and they, they go around to your house, hopefully, on New Year's Eve, and when you wake up on New Year's morning, if you've got lots of smashed plates outside your house, apparently it's a blessing. So just Google it. It's a blessing if you've got all this smashed crockery outside your door. I don't know how much of a blessing that would be because you've got to sweep it all up. You know, we've been sweeping needles up in church for the last two weeks, I think three weeks. We're still sweeping needles up. How much of a blessing is that? But it, apparently it is a blessing, and apparently it's good luck. So the more plates you have outside your front door on New Year's morning is how much blessing and luck that you're going to get in 22. What about this one? In Japan, the ringing of bells. So if you're in Japan, if you have the... Um, the privilege of actually being there for New Year, you would see or you would hear lots and lots of bells ringing in the New Year. And apparently the tradition goes that the louder the bells are, it banishes the sins of the people from the previous year. So you're, you're smashing out. You're, you're just getting rid of those old sins from the previous year, and it's a real good look for the New Year. With no sin... And that's what we get with Jesus, isn't it? Jesus died on the cross, gives us that opportunity to move forward without sin. So that's what they're remembering in Japan. And as we move forward, I've got a few of these. Um, oops, did you see that? Let me put that back on for you. Latin America. Well, I knew you'd get a laugh with this one. In Latin America, apparently, the color of your underwear is going to determine what type of new year you're going to get. I am not going to ask. <laughs> but apparently, in Mexico and Bolivia and Brazil, the color of your underwear is going to um, determine your fortune for the new year. In Italy, it's going, all, it's going back to front, this thing. There we go. In Italy, chuck out your chintz. So don't be walking outside somebody's house early on, um, New Year's Eve, or late on New Year's Eve, early on New Year's Day, because you might get something thrown on you, because they throw out all the old stuff that rem remem rem reminds them of what's gone on in the previous year. So anything that's not, they're not comfortable with, cushions, bed linen, curtains, whatever it is, they chuck it out the window, because they want to say goodbye to last year, because we want to look forward to the New Year. Argentina, you might have seen this before, shredded paper like confetti. So they shred up all their old stuff from the previous year and they throw it out the windows and it comes out like confetti. I and mean, this stuff on this picture just definitely looks like confetti. But you know, all those old letters that you might have, those old emails, those old bank statements that you might have that you don't want to remember anymore, they chuck them out because they just want to look forward to what's coming. But what does the Bible say? Oh, it's doing it again. It's crazy, this thing, isn't it? Let's just stop it there. I'll rely on Craig for the, for the rest of my slides. Um, yeah, what does the Bible say about this? What does Paul say in 2 Corinthians 15? I'm just going to read this. Um, he's reminding us about what he thinks is important, about, you know, not superstition, not what people are thinking, but what's really true. He says, we know what it means to respect the Lord, and we encourage everyone to turn to Him. We know what it means to respect the Lord, and we encourage everyone to turn to Him. For Himself knows what we are like, and I hope that you also know what kind of people that we are. We're not trying to brag about ourselves. And how many people do that, want to brag about themselves? They do things just to make themselves look big. But Paul says, no, we're not doing that. We don't want to brag ourselves. He says, but we want you to be proud of us. And there's a big difference, isn't there? We want you to be proud of us when we're with those who are not sincere and brag about others and about what they think about them. If we seem to be out of our minds, it's between us and God. But if we're in our right minds, it's for your good. Just think about that one. We are ruled by Christ's love for us, and we're certain that if one person died for everyone else, then we have all died. 
and Christ did die for us all. He died so that we no longer live for ourselves, but for those and the one who died and was raised to new life. We're careful not to judge people by what they seem to be, though we once judged Christ in that way. And then he gets to this certain point in this little passage, in this little letter that he's writing, and he says this amazing verse, uh, verse 17, and he says, anyone who belongs to Christ is a new person. The past is forgotten and everything is new. You know, Paul's telling us that we're, if we're in Christ, the old has gone and the new has come. So the big question for us today, 2nd of January 22, What's our attitude towards the new year? What's your attitude towards the new year? Are we looking forward to 2022 as an unbeliever with no hope? Or are we looking forward to 22 as a believer, as an ambassador actually of Christ, with all the resources of heaven that He gives us? And He does give us all those resources through the Holy Spirit so we have a choice to make. In other words, are we looking forward to having an amazing new year? Because we can all have an amazing new year if we want. You know, every year offers, offers us the chance of a new beginning. It offers us new hope for the future. But how many of us really believe it? How many of us really say, oh yes, I'm going to make a resolution. I'm going to move forward into the new year. But how many of us actually believe it? Or do we put ourselves in a position to receive those blessings from God? You know, it might be that we, we think that we're ready for the new year, and we say, right, I've drawn a line. I'm going to, this is what I'm going to do for the new year. But then we bring all the old baggage along with us, and that's the problem. Albert Einstein said this, He says, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. And that is so true, isn't it? You know, we move forward into 22 with all these ideas, but we then bring all these same things. We, do this, we get up in the morning, we do exactly the same thing that we did yesterday in 21. You know, we make resolutions, don't we? We make resolutions that say, I'll quit this, or I'll start that, or I'll do this. But most of those resolutions don't even last a month. What about this resolution? My New Year's resolution is to break my New Year's resolution so I can actually succeed at something. And that is so true, isn't it? If we, if we do that, we've definitely made a resolution that we're going to keep. So you can all do that one. It's so, so easy, isn't it? You know, our attitude will affect everything that we do in 22, whether it ends up the way we want it or whether it ends up not the way we want it. It's really down to us to a, to a big degree. You know, it's a mindset thing. Another big question is what we're looking for in 22. Are we looking for hope? And if the answer is yes, then we need boldness. You know, if we think we're going to do something, we need to not just think about it, but we actually need to do it. We need to be bold enough to, to follow it through. And quite often in, in our own lives and in the life of our church, we get bogged down with the mundane stuff. We get bogged down with the finance, and we know finance is important, but it bogs us down. We look at some churches that have grown exponentially, and there's no way that they could have waited until the finances were in position before they did it because they would never have even dreamt about doing it because they would think we can never get the finances that we need to be able to do those things. So let's just plan. You know, I know churches that have bought a piece of land, but I've got no finance to build the church. But they nevertheless, they bought the piece of land because the next stage is we're going to build the church. But we're not thinking, let's get everything in position first, and then we'll buy the land, because the land will have gone. Somebody else will have bought it. There'll be a factory unit on that piece of land. So what are those things that we're thinking about? What's the real changes that we're looking at making? If we need to ask ourselves, perhaps we're heading in the wrong direction. If we're trying to fix ourselves or trying to blame other people, we're heading in the wrong direction. If we want to be renewed in 22, 
then we need to understand that we can't do it without Him because He's the one that is going to give us the strength to be able to do it. You know, it's, if we don't bring God into the situation, it's just going to be another year, another failed resolution, another failed goal. But remember, we always have the choice, don't we? We have the choice to do things because God gives us choices. Every minute of every day, we make decisions and we make choices, don't we? What am I going to have for my breakfast? What am I going to have for my lunch? Am I going to stay behind after church for a coffee or should I go home? Am I going to get in my car? Am I going to walk? What am I going to do? Am I going to go at 30 mile an hour or 40 mile an hour? Unconscious decisions, we're making them every single day. Every minute of every day, we are making decisions. So what I'm saying to you is we need to be making the right decisions in 22 we're right at the start of the new year. We've got a whole, you know, 363 days left after this one before we'll be celebrating and throwing that stuff out the window and shredding that confetti and doing all that stuff. 363 days left after this one. 363 days of choices that we're going to make. Are we going to make good ones or bad ones? The other day I was... Um, I was doing some stuff in my office, I was tidying up, and I put the computer on, went on YouTube, put Bethel Music on, and I was listening to some music, but it was actually, it wasn't just music I was listening to, which I didn't know at the time, it was, it was from a conference, and it was from the Arise and Shine conference last year, and this woman called Christine Kane was speaking. So as I'm sort of tinkering around, getting old books, throwing them out, doing what I was doing, tidying my office, the music stopped, and this person started speaking, and I'd started listening to her, and she'd got some quite amazing things to say, and I thought, I just want to share one thing that she said. Um, well, the first thing that she said was, do you want to rise and shine? Do you want to rise and shine? And I thought, yeah, do we want to rise and shine in 22? It's a question that we can ask ourselves, do we want to do that? And then she told some real hard truths, and it was easy for her because she wasn't at the church where she ministers. She was at, she was at a conference. So it's so easy when, um, when a visiting minister comes to a church and you ask them to preach, and they can lay it right thick on the line. And she laid it on the line with these people at this conference, and she says, you know, we just do these things, and... Um, we really, we really need to think about what we're doing in the new year. You know, whether we want to, if we want to make an advancement in our, in, in our life, in our life with Christ, then, you know, it's, it's up to us to do it. We can't just sit around and do it. And um, what she said is, you know, well, she basically said this in a nutshell because I don't want to just recap what she said. But she said, you know, when, when we become a follower of Christ, we're saved. We all know that, don't we? Or if you don't know it, then you need to know it. That when we, when we say that we become a follower of Christ, we are saved by grace alone, and we're not saved by good works. But she said, then you really, you should be compelled to do good works, because it's not right not to do good works. And in um, Matthew 5, Jesus says this. He says, Let your good works shine out before all men, that they may see the glory of your Father which is in heaven. She says, It's no good just being a person who, likes it, who keeps liking things on Facebook. You know, you see things that are being done in the church. You see things that are being done in the community. She says, Don't just keep liking it on Facebook. She says, You need to get off your backside and you need to be getting... You need to be getting doing it yourself. Stop liking and start doing, she says. And I thought, yeah, that was just, you know, I was really amazed at what she was saying, but it was the truth. And as we've been saying for weeks and weeks and weeks, and as Jesus says, it's the truth that sets us free from all this stuff. I want to briefly turn to Matthew 9, uh, where there's a focus shift as Matthew's writing this gospel, and there's been a, up to up to this moment in, in um, chapter 9, it's all been focused on Jesus' ministry. 
you know, Matthew's like recording everything that's gone on, and, uh, and he starts to record Jesus' ministry. And then there's a, there's a shift, there's like a paradigm shift where Matthew starts to talk about our ministry, about what Jesus wants us to do. And it's the same thing. Don't just keep liking, whether it's on Facebook or not, don't just keep liking what Jesus is doing, but start doing what Jesus is telling us to do. And when we think about it, that's humbling, it's challenging, and it's exciting for us. It says this, Jesus went throughout all the cities and the villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed, aren't we all at times, harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And then he says this amazing verse to his disciples. He says, the harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few, therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of heaven to send the laborers into the harvest. As a young or mature Christian, this is a very familiar verse. You know, if you're new to Christianity, you'll probably know this. If, even if you've never even thought about following Christ, I think people in the secular world know this, you know, that there's a lot of work out there, but the laborers are few. And people know this verse. But, you know, it comes with a, like, caveat does this, because the one thing is, there's a familiar response to this verse. The laborers are few, but the work is plentiful. And the response is this, from 80% of Christians, let someone else do it. I think Mike Joyce stood up about two months ago at the beginning of a service, and he was saying exactly the same thing. 20% of the people do 80% of the work. So that leaves 80% of the people doing very, very little. If we want to be a true follower in Christ, if we want to keep to Christ's teachings, then we need to do the things that He's mandated us to do. We can't expect other people to keep doing it. You see, the big question that we need to keep asking ourselves is, what part do I want to play in this? What part do I want to play in the kingdom of God? There are, therefore, he says, if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. And the key word is, in Christ. It doesn't say that people that know Christ. You know, I know what a Bentley car looks like, but I haven't got one. It's exactly the same. I know what the space shuttle used to look like, but I never had a ride in it. The key word is, in Christ. It doesn't say, of Christ. It doesn't say that I know of Christ. It says, are you in Christ are you a follower? Are you connected? And if we're connected, there's an intimate relationship going on. You know, we, we, in, in our own relationships, in our human relationships, we drift and we come together and we drift and we come together. And it's exactly the same. So don't beat yourself up if you've not been that close to Christ, that co close to the Lord, because it's the beginning of 22 and we can make some changes you know, we can read the Bible more. We can listen to UCB radio some more. We can listen to the thought of the day. We can do more of that. So don't beat yourself up. But He does offer us a new life and a new opportunity to be that new creation. Finally, I just want to recap on, um, on some instructions that we find in the four Gospels. You know, in John's Gospel, this is Jesus giving instructions at like the end of his earthly life. He's about to go back to the Father. And in John's gospel, it's recorded like this. Follow me, he says. Follow me. He says it to Peter, and he's saying it to us. Follow me. When we get to Luke's gospel, Jesus reminds his disciples that they need to wait for the Holy Spirit. He says, wait, and the Holy Spirit will come. And in Mark's gospel, he says, go into the world and preach the good news. And then when we get to Matthew's gospel, he says, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. And we call that the Great Commission. As Christians, it's the Great Commission. It's what he's mandating us to do. And when we put all that together, what does it say? Follow me, 
get connected in other words, follow me, wait for the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we don't do enough for that. We don't do enough waiting for the Holy Spirit. I must say, I don't know whether it was Christmas morning, I played, the last song that I played was about, I don't know, 10 minutes long. And I got a nudge from Michelle saying, it's been going on a while. And it had been going on a while, but the fact is, I was connected. It didn't matter whether it was been going on for 10 minutes or, or half an hour or an hour, because I could have just listened to that same thing over and over again. Because once we make the connection, that's what we need to be thinking about. It's about making the connection with Christ. So follow me, wait for the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will come if we ask I've said it many, many times. It's like going into your kitchen and turning on the tap. If you don't turn on the tap, the water's not going to come out. You can stand there all you want with your kettle. You can put it under the faucet. It is not going to come out unless you tell it to come out. The way you tell it is to turn the tap. And the way we tell it with the Holy Spirit is to say, come, Holy Spirit, will you just come? And we need to continually say to God, come, Holy Spirit. And then finally, he says, Go and make disciples of all nations. Now, what does all nations mean to us in our locality here in Thornton? It means our local village, our next-door neighbors, our people that we see at the bus stop, the people that we meet in the charity shop, all those things. that they're, they're out, Go out and make disciples of all nations. We have got all nations in our multicultural city of Bradford. So let's just go out. Let's just pray for them. So follow me, wait for the Holy Spirit, go and make disciples of all nations. And I think that's a plain and simple mandate that God gave to each and every one of us. So perhaps we should leave the resentment behind of 21, leave the worries of 21 behind, leave the failures of 21 behind, because we're not meant to carry that stuff into this year. Hurts need to be given to God. Worries take up too much of our time, don't they? We worry, 90% of the stuff that we worry about never, ever happens, so why do we do it? There's only two things that we need to have on our mind, changing the things that we need to change and working out what we need to do. You know, some people say, I'm a failure. I'm not going to be able to do any of that stuff in 22. But let me tell you, you're only a failure when you don't do anything. You're only a failure when you don't try. And it might be you're frightened to do new things, frightened to work at the food bank, frightened to work in the charity shop, frightened to operate the sound desk. But what are we frightened of? Frightened to make a cup of coffee. But we make cups of coffee at home. We seem to be quite good at it, so why don't we do it in church? Simple question. And, you know, what if I get it wrong is the question that I always get asked. What if I... Get it wrong. Well, the fact is, if you get it wrong, you've still got it better than the person that didn't even try to have a go. Just think about that. You know, sometimes, you know, when I was little and I would break things, when I was doing things, I remember my grandma once, we had a glass coffee table, and she broke the glass, so it was, it was like a wooden G-plan coffee table, and she used to take the glass out of it because dust would get round the rim, and she'd take the glass out, and she'd clean it, and she'd clean the rim, and then she'd put the glass back. And, you know, she broke it. And the man from the Prue, do you remember the man from the Prue? He used to come every week or every month, I don't know. And when he came, she says, he says, you all right? She goes, I broke my coffee table. I broke the glass. And he says, fine. He said, just think of it this way. He said, the people that do the work are the ones that make the mistakes. The people that do the work are the ones that make the mistakes. The people that never make a mistake are the people that never, ever get anything done. And there was something on TV last night. We was watching a film, and um, the same thing, you know, like Einstein says, and, and we get Edison saying that he never failed at what he did. He just, he just didn't do it right so many times until finally we get it right. Finally, you will be able to make the perfect cup of coffee. So come on. Jesus says, knock and the door will be opened. He will give us the resources of heaven, but we've got to ask for them. 
Knock and the door will be opened. Ask and you will receive. So just to recap, our attitude goes a long way into determining what our 22 is going to look like. Whether we're going to do the things in our own strength or whether we're going to do the things in His strength. And His strength is unlimited. He has an unlimited strength, an unlimited arsenal of things that He can give us through the gifts of the Holy Spirit. You know, for the last week, there's been a song that has been going through my head day after day after day. And we came into church, I think it was on Friday, and um, Kevin was here, and, um, and I says, what song is this from? The hopes and dreams of a thousand years are born in you tonight. We sing it at Christmas. And Kevin went into the vestry and he got an old in book out and he found it. And he said, oh, here it is. You know, in that little town of Bethlehem, those hopes and dreams were birthed. A thousand years people have been wondering, hoping, do we just sing it or do we believe it? That's the question that we need to ask ourselves this morning. Do we just sing it or do we believe it? Do we believe that the hopes and dreams of thousands of years were born on that night when Jesus was birthed in that stable? Shall we pray? Father, we just uh, thank you for the, the many blessings that you bestow on us each and every day. We thank you that, you know, after thousands of years, the hopes and dreams of many, many people were birthed in that stable that night. We just thank you for that, Lord. We thank you that you just found us worthy to come as a baby, to give up your divinity in heaven and come as a human being to experience the things that we experience in our lives. And we just thank you for that, Lord. And we just pray now that through the gifts of the Holy Spirit that you will enlighten us as what you want us to do in 22. Give us the strength. Give us the boldness just to move forward in your name. And everyone said, Amen. You know, quite often I think that we're slaves to the things that have happened in our lives. Many things have happened in all our lives, all different things to different people at different times in our lives, and that makes us a slave. Sometimes we're a slave to sin, but we can just think and be rest assured in Christ that we can be set free. So should we stand and let's sing. You unravel me with a melody You surround me with a song I've delivered from my enemies Till all my fears have come 